Praise the Lord. Church, if you are there, I said, Praise the Lord. I pray the precious Lord will keep every one of us faithful and strong until the very end in Jesus' name. Whatever comes and whatever goes, I pray the Lord will keep you faithful. And the Lord will keep you in rewardable service in Jesus' name. God bless everyone today. God bless me. And God bless you. Father, we thank you for this glorious service. We bless your name for calling us together so you can work out something within us and produce in us the very image of Christ that you've done in the lives of other people. And we're asking, Lord, that in every vicissitude of life, every challenge of life, at every crossroad, the might of Christ, the model of Christ, and the strength of Christ, with all the grace we need, your grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Give us the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the nature of Christ, that Lord will serve you acceptably in this life in Jesus' name. Keep us ever in your sight. No failure, no defeat, no discouragement, no turning back. What you have appointed us to do in life, we will do without any distraction in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life today. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church shout. I'm coming to First Peter chapter 1. And I'm reading verse 1 to you. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You find here that Peter, the apostle, first of all, Peter, the convert, Peter, the Christian, Peter, the follower, Peter, the servant of God, Peter, the evangelist, Peter, the backslider, Peter, the restored, and Peter, the one baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, and Peter, the apostle. And eventually, he came up. Out of his discouragement, out of his weakness, and he became an apostle. And he says, this is Peter writing to you, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter went through the whole journey and we are called today to go through the whole journey. Peter had challenges. There were persecutions. He went through. You will go through. There was pressure. He went through. And you will go through. And that appointment, the Lord that said, originally, follow me. And I will make you a fisher of men. Became fulfilled. And so that means from the commencement to the consummation, from the beginning to the final end, whatever comes in between will not stop the plan and the purpose of God in your life in Jesus' name. And here Paul and Peter now, having come out of that kind of situation, he now could stand and he now could say, Peter, an apostle, of Jesus Christ and is writing to the strangers who are strangers and pilgrims in this world and whatever happens we know that this is not our final home it's not a final place of abode 
there is a place waiting for us where will be the real citizen of that land my father's house how many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you this was strangers that were scattered everywhere and he says it's the same thing with us we come from different places and we're scattered everywhere we come together now to the service and we'll soon go to the places we're scattered to and there are different conditions and different situations in all those places we're scattered to and so peter is writing to us the strangers and the pilgrims on this earth who are scattered all abroad look at second peter chapter one i'm reading from verse one it says simon peter a servant and apostle of jesus christ is now joining another word which is the basic word the underlying word the important word peter i am a servant of jesus christ and why would he be telling us that he was a servant of the lord jesus christ because the same calling that those apostles had, the same calling we have, and they have given us a model, an example, a pattern. The life they live is what the Lord is calling us to live. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints actually until we come to the stature of the fullness of the measure of the lord jesus christ and so they are not in isolation actually as peter said there was a servant all the other apostles also said they were servants and they did that not only because it's true of course it's true but then to give us a pattern and a model we're looking at philippians chapter 3. in philippians chapter 3 i'm reading verse 17 brethren be followers together of me as an apostle he was an apostle and a servant of jesus christ and he said, all true believers are called to that same pattern of life, model of life. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as she have us for an example. An example. I'm looking at the word of God with you today on the apostles servant model for all true believers the apostles servant model the model of his servant the example of his servant the pattern of his servant and the demonstration of servitude in the life he has called us to live the apostles servant model for all true believers three things we're looking at number one the conversion and conviction of appointed servants he said we have not chosen him he has chosen us he has chosen us so that we'll be his follower he has chosen us so that we'll be a servant and he has conversion for us and conviction for us for appointed appointed servants point number two the commitment and consecration of appointed servants he has appointed us and if we're going to be acceptable in the sight of the lord we have to have the commitment every moment of our ministry every moment of our lives every area of our lives will have 
the commitment and the consecration of acceptable servants. That's the way we ought to live so that we present ourselves acceptable unto the Lord. And it is when we render acceptable service as acceptable servants on the final day he'll give us appropriate reward point number three the confirmation and the cultivation of approved servant church we need to cultivate it we need to develop it we need to bring it up we need to nurture it recognize it first receive it into your life and then make sure that you review every time that you have the confirmation in your life and you're checking up am i living like a servant am i acting like a servant am i projecting my life like a servant let there be a confirmation in your life and then cultivation you cultivate it this is approved servanthood this is inspired servanthood that he has in his world and you want to be approved on that final day when the day of reckoning comes point number three the confirmation and the cultivation of approved servant church number one what's your number one over there on your side thank you very much the conversion and the conviction of appointed servants we start with conversion christ started his own disciples by calling them out out of what they were into what he wanted them to be and he told them without that conversion nothing begins there's no beginning of the christian life without conversion there's no beginning of the christian ministry without conversion there is no beginning of a pilgrimage towards heaven without conversion Matthew chapter 18 and I'm reading from verse 3 Matthew chapter 18 verse 3 it says I'm verily and he said verily I say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven it begins with conversion for us to become an approved servant of God, appointed servant of God, anointed servant of God, eventually we must start with conversion. Why conversion? Well, we're in darkness. We cannot continue like that and get to heaven. We have to come to the light. That's conversion. We were sinful. We could not continue like that and get to the kingdom of heaven. We must be purged. We must be forgiven. We must be cleansed. We must be totally changed from a life of sinfulness. We were also in the world and were the world. And we lived and acted like the world. And his kingdom is not of this world. There must be a change, a transformation and the conversion out of the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of his dear son if we're going to start the christian life at all the conversion of an approved servant except he be converted he tells us ye cannot enter ye cannot be my servants ye cannot be my followers he tells us in acts of the apostles chapter 3 Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 and I'm reading here from verse 19 it says repent ye therefore and be converted repent ye therefore and be converted you see what he's telling us we need to turn away from the past and then face a righteous future 
and face the glorious path, the narrow way that leads to heaven. Repent ye therefore. Are there evils in anyone's heart? Repent ye therefore. Are there sinful practices in anyone's life? Repent ye therefore. Is there a heart that is departing from God and departing from the way of righteousness? They repent ye therefore. Is there something that will close the door of heaven to any one of us on that final day? Repent ye therefore and be converted. That means we'll become a totally new and different person from what, what we were before. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You are asking yourself, is there an evidence of total conversion, true conversion, visible conversion, identifiable conversion in my life? Am I truly converted? I look at my past, I look at my present and I saw the works of the flesh in the past and today what do I project and who am I? Am I still in the works of the flesh? Have I turned over having the fruit of the spirit? Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and then it says when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Refreshing, renewal, regeneration, a turning around, a total change comes upon our lives. And it says the times of refreshing comes and it comes from the presence of the Lord. And it is that conversion, it is that change, it is that transformation that actually brings us into the kingdom before we become the servants of the Lord, chosen, appointed by the Lord. Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 3. Acts chapter 15, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenice and Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Declaring the conversion of the sinners. Declaring the conversion of the people of the world. The Lord had told them, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem in Judea, in Samaria, then to the uttermost part of the earth. They had gone to the uttermost part of the earth and to their great joy, they discovered that the people were willing to listen. They were willing to abandon their old ways and come to the way of the Lord. And now they came back to the church to tell the conversion of the Gentiles that they went to and they cause great, great joy in the hearts of the believers, the conversion and then the conviction. Let's look at James chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. James chapter 5, verse 19. Brethren, in a, if any of you do err from the truth, it's showing us the people that need conversion, those who err from the truth, those who go astray from the truth, those who sway off, they branch off from the truth, and they are following a tangent that will lead them into perdition. It says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him he needs conversion anyone whatever the past profession whatever the past testimony and whatever the past touch from heaven now the life he lives shows that it's gone off on a tangent 
and one now convert him let him know that he which converted the sinner sinners need conversion backsliders are sinners they need conversion he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death what's the implication of that if he says i was a believer i'm always a believer i gave my life to the lord i'm always with the lord no matter what i do now no matter how i live now i'm always a child of god if he dies in that deception he dies the second death and he dies forever and is lost forever let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and hide a multitude of sins if you come back to Luke chapter 22 Luke chapter 22 I'm going to read from verse 31 and verse 32 but before I do that I'm going to back up to verse 28 for a purpose look at this Luke chapter 22 verse 28 ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations in my trials in my troubles you my disciples you my followers peter included you have followed me and continued with me in all my temptations and i appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel that's the promise he gave all of them peter included now the verses i wanted to read for you to understand verse 31 and the lord said simon simon behold satan has desired to have you remember what jesus said you have continued with me in all my trials in all my tribulation in all my temptation in all my trouble you have continued with me you will sit on the throne judging the 12 tribes of israel after saying that anybody like peter like me like you will sit back on our armchair and say praise the lord he's told me the end and he's told me i am going to sit on the throne and I'm going to be a judge over the 12 tribes of Israel along with the other apostles. And so I can relax now. No more watchfulness and no more carefulness and no more living the life. I am eternally secured. You could have said that. Look at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon behold satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat for started you but i have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not if you stopped there you'll say peter go ahead and enjoy your life and live the way you want to live jesus has prayed for you but look at this and when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren when thou art converted he was talking to peter this is one of the people he had sent out and two by two he sent them and they cast out devils and they healed the sea and they preached the gospel and he called the people to repent he was a follower of Jesus. In verse 28, he said, You have followed me until this time.
but temptation is going to come a maid is going to ask you whether you know me or not surprisingly peter you're going to deny me and then after that denial you mustn't die in that condition if you die in that condition you are dead separated from god forever and ever a conversion will need to take place for the backslider and so when you are converted strengthen thy brethren and so we understand for us to be the servants of god approved servants of god there must be conversion and there must be conviction the conviction that he has called me and i am to follow after and i am now a servant of the lord i'm looking at first corinthians chapter 7 in first corinthians chapter 7 he tells us in verse 22 he says for he that is called in the lord being a servant is a lost free man likewise also he that is called being free is christ's servant he's talking to all believers now he's saying it's not only the apostles you must have the conviction as the apostle peter is a servant of the lord converted and having conviction the same thing with me i must be a servant of the lord a sister your brother you are a member of the body of christ or a child of god you are called to be converted and after that conversion you have the understanding that you are a servant of the lord we're coming to ephesians chapter 6 ephesians chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 6 ephesians chapter 6 verse 6 not waste i service now we're serving the lord i want to serve the lord from all our heart all our soul all our mind from deep conviction he says not with eye service as men pleasers now we are called to be servants of the lord as one conviction i'm not going to please myself you're not going to please yourself you're not going to please any man you're not going to please any human being in the church or outside the church not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of christ talking to believers now not only apostles as servants of christ doing the will of god from the heart that's the conviction you have it's called you to be a servant and you want to do that will of god and do it from your very heart and you must be asking yourself is that my conviction anywhere i stand anywhere i serve anywhere i live anywhere i operate whatever i do known or not known seen or not seen by men do i place myself in a position i know i am serving the lord we're looking at romans chapter 6. romans chapter 6 i read from verse 16. know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey is servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death if you go back to your old pattern of life of sinning it brings death or obedience or of obedience unto righteousness but god beside that ye were servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that that form of doctrine which is delivered unto you being made free from sin ye became 
the servants of righteousness talking to all believers will become the servants of righteousness look at verse 22 and be now made free from sin and become servants to God believers like the apostles are servants to God like the ministers are servants to God the members must have the conviction we are servants to God it says ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life that's the conviction we have we're servants of Christ we're servants of God we're servants of righteousness we're servants of holiness we're servants of the church we come to point number two now and it's the commitment and consecration of acceptable servants now that we understand and we've experienced the conversion and we have internalized the conviction it now remains that we prove it by the life we live commitment as a servant commitment that we totally commit ourselves to the one who has appointed us to be his servants and it is not a forced service a forced attitude that somebody has to force us into this it is a voluntary action that brings total commitment like the apostles were totally committed come to exodus we're looking at exodus chapter 21 and i'm reading from verse 2 exodus chapter 21 verse 2 if thou buy an hebrew slave buy an hebrew, hebrew slave that word buy means to purchase and you know we are purchased by the price of the blood of jesus christ if thou buy an hebrew servant six years he shall serve and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself if he were married then his wife shall go out with him that is he got the woman the wife before he became a servant and the master was not the one that gave him that wife and he says now i want to go i've completed six years okay you can go and go with your wife but hold on verse four if his master have given him a wife and she have born him sons and daughters the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself the picture is this he came having nothing when he came to the master no wife of course no children no property nothing he was in abject poverty having nothing on earth having no record nothing in heaven but now he came and since he came his master has blessed him and you remember our own situation we didn't have a name in heaven we didn't have an inheritance in heaven we didn't have any blessing from heaven we didn't have the favor of god from heaven and we didn't even have the material things of this world but we came in and as they said that was going to bless us he has blessed us now there are those who have got wives husbands children property a name in heaven inheritance in heaven that faded not away a lot of things we have got but now if that servant will forget himself 
and say, I'm going out. I'm going away. This is drudgery. This is a kind of dull service for me. And I don't want to stay anymore. He goes empty-handed. All the inheritance is God. And of course, the inheritance in heaven is going to lose everything. That's what he's saying here. Come back to that verse 4. If his master had given him a wife, she and she has born him sons and daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, if somebody here, a child of God, chosen by Christ, called by Christ, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If he says, my master is Jesus, I love master Jesus, I have affection for master Jesus, I will not go away from master Jesus. Come what may, rain or sunshine, trial or tribulation, difficulties or challenges, crossroads or conflicts, I'm going to be for my master. That's a commitment. That's a consecration. We're told if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges for witness, and he also shall bring, he shall also bring him that servant to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an all, and he shall serve him Tell me what you find in your Bible. Tell me out aloud. I see if it's applicable to you. It shall serve him forever. He carries a mark, an evidence that could be seen everywhere. His master will bore a hole in the ear. By the way, that's not for jewelry. That's not for ornament. By the way, that's not for fashion. It is a mark of consecration, a mark of total yieldedness. How is it you have a hole in your ear and you are not uh, having something there to fill it up? And you will say, it wasn't supposed to be filled up. By the way, have you noticed it's only in one ear, only in one ear. And every time you see that hole and there is nothing there, it's a mark. I have left the world. I have left self. I've left everything. I'm now totally abandoned and totally, absolutely committed unto the Lord. I'm not supposed to fill it up. The empty space in the ear there is to remind me when I look at the mirror. I totally, completely, entirely forever belong to my master that's the conviction the conviction and the consecration of a servant that is acceptable i'm coming to second samuel the servant the attitude of that servant the conviction of that servant the commitment of that servant the consecration of that servant coming to Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 15. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 15. This is what any apostle could say. And this is what every member, every child of God, Every converted one should say as an acceptable servant. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 15. And the king's servant said unto the king, Jesus 
is our king is the king of kings and the lord of lords and we are his servants and we his servants will say unto him behold thy servants are ready to do whatsoever thy my lord the king shall appoint what he was saying is this when we came we came with a blank sheet of paper and we signed at the bottom and we're handing over that blank sheet of paper unto you feeling anything say anything command anything write anything whatsoever my lord the king shall command that we your servants will do that's what you're telling the lord jesus we don't know what will come tomorrow we don't know what assignment it will give tomorrow we don't know what direction it will lead tomorrow it may be something we're used to already conversant ways already convenient ways already is something compassionate that is comparable compatible with what we've been doing before we're ready we'll do it but it might be something new we've not done this before and it's charting a new course it's charting a new direction we are not the master we are not to control the master the master is to control our lives that's why our commitment and consecration as acceptable servants is behold the servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint we come to first kings and i'm reading from chapter 20. first kings chapter 20 and here i'm reading from verse 4. first kings chapter 20 verse 4 the commitment and the consecration of acceptable servants in chapter 20 of first kings verse 4 the king of israel and said and said my lord o king look at that a king in israel is calling another person my lord o king many of us you understand he has called us to be kings and to be priests your king in your family your queen in your family your king may be your place of work, the leader there, the director there, your king. Your king in your community, they look up to you. Your king as a breadwinner. And now you have, although you are a king with a little K there, a small K there, there is a higher king, a greater king with a capital K. His name is Jesus. His title is King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in verse 4, And the king of Israel answered and said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. I am thine. I'm not more going to use my life, spend my life, the way I want. I'm not going to say, my hands is yours. My feet, they're yours. My eyes, they're yours. My intelligence, it's yours. My possession, is yours. My past, everything in your hand. My present, everything in your hand. My future, whatever I might achieve, I might possess. Here is the calling of a person that is bought by the precious blood of the Lamb, that is no more free to use what he has for Satan, 
for self, for sin, for the untoward society, for the world is totally, completely, entirely without any reservation belonging to God. I am yours and all that I have. We're coming to First Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 6, I read from verse 19. It says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, your servant. Your life does not belong to you, ye are not your own. Your strength does not belong to you, ye are not your own. And your plans and strategies, they do not belong to you anymore. Ye are not shown, for ye have bought your purchase with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Don't glorify yourself. I must put on this to make myself, accept not yourself, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are gods that means they belong to god entirely completely because now you are servants of the lord i'm coming to colossians chapter 3 colossians chapter 3 reading from verse 17 whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord giving thanks to God and the Father by him whatever you cannot do in the name of the Lord you will not do you cannot cheat in the name of the Lord lie in the name of the Lord fight in the name of the Lord Get angry in the name of the Lord. Retaliate in the name of the Lord. And you cannot steal money in the name of the Lord. You cannot have worldliness. I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. No, you can't. And you cannot destroy another person's life, another person's family, another person's uh, profession in the name of the Lord. Whatever you cannot do in the name of the Lord, you will not do. What can you do in the name of the Lord? Whatever Christ has done, whatever Christ was once done. That's who we are as the servants of the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him verse 23 it says in verse 23 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily happily cheerfully excitedly practically positively and you do it purposefully and whatsoever you do do it heartily as unto the lord and not unto men knowing that of the lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance look at this look at this for ye serve the lord christ for ye serve the Lord Christ. He wants us to understand that every time. You give a, co a, a cup of cold water to a, bro to a brother, to a sister, do it in the name of the Lord. And you serve in any capacity within the temple, outside the sanctuary, anywhere, anytime which in the name of the Lord with the heart and the mind and the concept and the spirit 
of a servant, a servant of the Lord. Romans chapter 12, I read verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercy that got you saved, the mercy that got you sanctified, the mercy that gives you inheritance in heaven that fadeth not away, the mercy that has brought you as a bona fide member of the body of Christ, it says, I beseech you, I plead with you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Verse 9, let love be without pretense without hypocrisy, without dissimulation, abhor, reject, shun, jettison, that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned as you serve one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Maybe there are some things that are not comfortable, convenient, that are not compatible with what you have been desiring. Be patient, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Don't curse. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Don't make them weep. But if something has happened to them, that causes them sorrow, sadness, weeping. You say, what's in that? What's the big deal? Is that what you're crying about? Is that what you're weeping about? You say, don't say that. Put yourself in their shoes. If you were as weak as they are, if you were as confused as they were, you will also be showing the same emotion and the same sentiment. So rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. To start with your own family, live peaceably with your wife and children. Don't always be, you know, fighting about something. Every day has its challenge. Every day has its friction. And then you are angry every time. You are, you are not like that before. We're almost forgetting your good, godly, gracious personality. Because now, in the family, there is something to grind. And in the church, there's something to grind. In your place of work, there's something to grind. You are not like that. Come back to where you ought to be 
apparently is because you are thinking too much of yourself too much of yourself i must have this i must have this i must have that forget about that now you are a servant i must give that i must supply that i must help that area i must lift up that person i must sympathize with that person i must build up what belongs to that person that's what you think you recompense evil to no man and you're not wise in your conceit and you provide things on it in the sight of all men dearly beloved in verse 19 dearly beloved avenge not yourselves what if i do you're not a servant avenge not yourself if you're a servant in the master's house and the master has done something against you deliberately or unintentionally and you cannot get at the master you don't take it on his children if you do you're not a good servant the children have not offended you the master by carelessness might have offended you you cannot take it on his children if you're a christian and the same thing we were children of god avenge not yourselves the people of god have not offended you there might be one isolated person there that offended you localize the offense isolate the offense don't punish 20 people here don't punish 20 25 30 thousand people for the offense of one man one woman that offended you that's not proportionate and that doesn't show that you have a normal reasoning mind that's why it says dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto us for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay says the lord therefore look at this if thine enemy hunger tell me I can't hear my people. And you know, I don't think uh, such people are here. If they are here, don't show yourself. Don't trace up your hand. That's a problem in the family. And the wife refuses to cook. I will not cook. He doesn't demand. This man doesn't appreciate me. Doesn't appreciate my food. And I'm cooking and cooking and cooking every time. And the man will not even say thank you. I will not say that's good that's wonderful i enjoy this it also wipes the plate and then he goes his way and his attitude to me is lousy it's terrible i will not cook for him anymore to start with is not even your enemy and yet if he were your enemy therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him Oh, there are some men i hope they are not here a little thing has happened i want this i'm sorry my husband try to understand i'm not in a position to give that now every time you say no, every time you say no okay and then the feeding money should be given and uh, she says my husband feeding money feeding money I'm not in a position to give that now. Are you telling me what I told you the other time? I said I'm not in a position to give you now. How are we going to eat? I don't know. When we're in a position to give, we will give. Think about that. And she's not even your enemy. And it says, if the enemy hunger, what do we do? Let me hear the voice of the church. If he thirsts, what do we do? 
give him dream for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head be not overcome of evil what does that mean not allow evil to change your personality you know what when you are going to get a particular job you add a well-defined personality kind loving extrovert cheerful outgoing happy you carried yourself like a king like a queen and everybody will know that person just came to our company here and see how she walks and see how he walks you add a defined personality and now having I get into that place and they throw this at you and throw that at you and dump this upon you and put this in your way and do whatever to tear you apart your personality begins to change you are beginning to change because you are not responding to your inner voice and the inner personality and the person, the giant on the inside of you. You are responding to the pressures outside. It says, be not overcome of evil. Get down to the depths of the sea and come up again and be pushed to the wall and bounce back again and be trampled upon and shake yourself from the doors and get up and move on that your personality will not be changed by all the pressures around you in Jesus name you're a new creature say I'm a new creature you are a king say I'm a king you are a queen say I'm a queen God has lifted me to the top. Say, so He has lifted me to the top. I will not go to the valley. Say, so I will not go to the valley. The personality that the King of Kings has given me will not be overcome. I will not be destroyed by anything that happens here below. Today, you will get up. Today, you will rise up. Remember once again, it's a new year. It's a new year. And this new year is going to be the best I ever live in my life in Jesus' name. Say it for yourself. The Lord confirm it for you in Jesus' name. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what that means? Overcome every frown with a smile. Overcome hatred with love. Overcome discouragement with courage. Overcome fear with fearlessness. Overcome unbelief with faith. You will overcome. I have overcome. I said, I have overcome. Number three, the confirmation and the cultivation of approved servanthood. The confirmation and the cultivation of approved servanthood. The Lord wants us to cultivate ourselves, to educate ourselves, to enlighten ourselves not to be negligent of ourselves we have just one life and if there's any life you can cultivate you can develop you can strengthen you can beautify if there's any life you can make profitable it is your single life you might not be able to improve on the life of this the life of this and life of that but this single life that nobody has any authority over that you pick it up and you say i'm going to cultivate the desire the demand of the lord for this single life 
it means you are not going to be lazy you are not going to be idle you are not going to be negligent you're going to take this life the single life of yours you'll cultivate it in jesus name give me a good good amen i'm looking at proverbs chapter 24 verse 30 proverbs chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 30 i went by the field of the slothful the idol the slugger i wait by the by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding he doesn't know life is going time is going and the years are going he has a field he has a vineyard it's not cultivating that vineyard. And we go by the field, by the vineyard of that man, the 31, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Stone wall. A wall that is supposed to face out the animals, the birds, the bees, is not taking care of that wall. And it is broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and I received instruction. I looked upon the life of the careless, the field of the careless, and the experience of the backslider. I look at him going from good to bad, from bad to worse, from worse to the worst, and I take instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hand to sleep so shall thy poverty come as one that travails and thy want as an armed man is telling us we need to cultivate our person our personality we need to cultivate the approved servitude from of the Lord, Second Timothy, chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two, verse fifteen. Study to show thyself approved. Endeavor to show thyself approved. There are many people that try to improve other people's lives. And they try to pump courage into other people's lives. And they try to bring improvement in other people's lives. If they spend the time, they spend on other people to get those other people awakened and to get those other people strengthened and to get those other people at a large, and to get those other people to develop the sterling qualities of the Lord, if they spend all that time on themselves, they will become an angel in a short time. But they have forgotten themselves, and they have forgotten their calling. It says now, wake up. And study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I pray you all do it. I will keep on doing it. I said I will keep on doing it. Somebody there, I said, I will keep on doing it. The Lord give you the strength of character and the strength of courage that you will work on yourself. 
work on your life improve on your life don't spend your energy on that which profits you not don't try to help others while you yourself remain helpless and hopeless rise up and say today i want to take care of the cultivation of my own approved servanthood isaiah chapter 52 isaiah chapter 52 i read from verse 1 awake awake put on thy strength o zion don't put that strength on other people put it on yourself Put on the beautiful garment to Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Give me a good amen. amen. But you shake thyself. Don't shake another person. Don't shake your friends. Don't shake your neighbors. Don't shake your enemies. Don't shake members of the church. Yourself. Yourself. Improve on yourself. Bring up yourself. Dedicate yourself to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'm going to work on this one. And it's no hindrance. You have the liberty, night and day, morning and evening, to work on this one person, yourself, shake thyself from the dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. All the bands, all the yokes are broken today. O captive daughter of Zion. Look at chapter 54. In chapter 54, Verse 1, sing, O barren, thou that didst bear, not that didst not bear, break forth into singing. Bring back your personality. Bring back your real self, who you are. Cry aloud, thou that didst not travail, O child, for more are the children of the desolate and the children of the married wives, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Are you hear an amen there? Yeah. You know what? The things that happen to us, trials, tribulation, trouble, adversity, difficulties, changes in life. You know what they do? They push us, push us, push us into a corner. You don't even want to come out anymore. You are confined in one place. That's exactly what the enemy wanted to do in your life. They don't want your life to have expression. Your life to have excitement. And your life to have a breaking forth. They want to keep on pushing and pushing and pushing. They push a little, you retreat. They push a little, you retract. They push a little, and then you retard your speech. Until they push you into a corner and the world will forget you. And what you are called upon to do in the world, you are not even getting out there to do. Your personality is now crowded in, and you have, you have shrunk, and you're not the person you ought to be. That's why it says, now, get all those things broken today, and come out and do what the Lord has called you to do. You will. I said you will. You will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Enlarge your tent. And they performed an experiment some time ago. There were two kinds of fish, two types. One aggressive, wanting to attack another fish. The other one 
like research, not having an outgoing personality, just swim and glide simply in the water. And if those two kinds of fish get into the same sea, ocean, river, this one will rush at the other one and strike. But the experiment they perform is they add a glass container so they can watch their action. They put a glass in between, that is a glass shield, transparent, and the fish could not see that. And they demarcated the place of that aggressive attacking fish. And they put that fish there, and they put the other fish where he also belongs. The first day, they got to their compartments, and that aggressive fish saw the other one. He went at it, but he knocked his head on the glass barricade, barrier. And then he tried again, and knocked himself against the barrier. And did that for many days, they were watching. And after doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and that glass barricade always stopping him, and these other feet just swimming and swimming and swimming. There's no problem now. Then quietly and gently, the people that performed the experiment, they removed the glass barricade, the glass shield. And guess what? That fish that will rush at the other one, just stage where he was put. Because he had tried to attack and to rush, and always the glass wall will stop it. And because of that, even when they removed the barricade, he was not rushing anymore. You know what? If you have an outgoing personality, I must achieve, you will achieve. I must take it, you will take it. The kingdom of God, sovereign violence, and the violent take it by force. And you are about to take. Your future is in your hand. Your prospect is in your hand. If you have been rushing and rushing and rushing, I want to take, I want to have, I want to possess, and there's always a barricade there. Eventually, that conditions you when that barricade is removed, you just stay quietly in a corner and you are confined, you are confined there and the burning sensation in you, that barricade has already quenched your fire. My fire will not be quenched. My zeal will not be taken away. Barricade or no barricade, I command that barricade myself, get out of my way, I am moving on. Are you going to move on? That's why it says, enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the, the cottages of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy courts and strengthen thy states, you will in Jesus' name. Amen. What if they try to stop me? Nothing will stop you if you don't allow it to stop you. I didn't get a good amen. amen. Verse 17, verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue, how many? Every tongue, I said how many? Every tongue everywhere, every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Are you ready? I said, are you ready to be who you ought to be and to do what you ought to do and to enlarge your coast and to serve the Lord 
and to serve the body of Christ and to serve your generation without any limitation or hindrance in your life. Lord, I will. Lord, I will. Lord, I am ready. Lord, I am willing. Lord, I will serve you without any hindrance, without any limitation, and without any restriction. Am I ready there? I said, am I ready there? I said, am I ready there? Rise up and tell the Lord, Lord, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. I will serve you. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. All those inhibitions, all those hindrances, all those limitations, cut them off. Cut them off. And get your personality back the way you ought to be. Your life back the way you ought to be. Let there be no outside control in your life. Let the Spirit of God move in in your life and be energized and be controlled and be propelled by the Spirit of God into acceptable servitude in the house of the living God.